Welcome to Pearson's how-to series, short informational webinars exploring key assessment concepts and features. I'm Dr. Adam Scheller, your narrator for today's session on monitoring progress with growth scale values and standard scores. Let's start this session by reviewing what information standard scores and percentile ranks provide us. Now standard scores have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Half of the population, given age or grade, will score 100. They are also equal interval, meaning that a difference between standard scores is comparable on any point of the continuum. So a 15 point difference, let's say from 110 to 125, is the same as the difference between 75 and 90. However, standard scores are in fact in relation to a norm group. So for example, the score of 100 corresponds to the 50th percentile for every age meaning that a person's performance is at or better than 50% of same aged or grade peers. This allows you to put relational meaning into a performance, and it makes it easier to compare performance to other standard score based tests. Percentile ranks are easy to interpret as an estimate of an examinee's performance on a single test. You can think of percentile rank as the percent of same aged peers that an examinee scored better than but it shouldn't be used to compare performance against two different tests or on the same test at different times. The reason is because percentile ranks aren't on an equal interval scale. The difference between percentile isn't equal at all points of the continuum the way that standard scores are. As you can see here in this normal curve distribution, the difference between standard scores of 100 and 115 represents 34% of the population while the difference between standard scores of 115 and 130 only represents about 13.5% of the population. Now growth scale values, or GSVs, link test items to a common scale with equal interval units of measurement. This linkage allows the addition and subtraction of growth scale values to document progress over time. GSVs measure ability on a developmental continuum, ranging from pre-K through adulthood. This continuum relates to ability or skill level and is not in comparison to a norm group. With GSVs, you're able to compare a single test across multiple administrations, not across multiple different tests. So for example, if you gave the PPVT5 to a youngster during an initial evaluation, and then again during a reevaluation, you can compare that child's performance across the two different administrations. You could not, however, compare the PPVT5 performance to the child's performance on another measure, let's say in comparison to the EVT3. Again, this performance is not in relation to the norm group, but in relation to a person's skill acquisition, so it's not dependent on the standardization sample's progress. GSVs are used to measure growth and track the progress of an individual. This metric is ideal when you need to make comparisons across administrations covering multiple grades and ages. It's also particularly useful for tracking the progress of students who are making progress relative to their own past performance on a test, but when they continue to be delayed in comparison to age and grade appropriate peers. Now finally, GSV can be used to evaluate the efficiency or efficacy of intervention programs by determining how a person has progressed on a particular skill or ability. Let's look at this slide to better understand how GSV increases or changes across grades. As an example, this chart shows the developmental growth of the total reading GSV score across grades for the normative sample on a test called the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test, third edition. As you can see, GSVs increase from grade to grade, and that reflects skill growth. In this example, the most significant increases are seen early on, which would be expected when young kids are learning to read. Also, as you can see, for reading, the growth rate decelerates in the upper grades, and that's also expected given that reading experiences less gains at that age. Now, this trajectory may not be the same for every skill we measure, but it's important to see that as children increase in age or progress through the grades, we should also see an increase in their skills. The size or magnitude of change in GSV 
represents growth. So when determining if an increase in GSV is quote unquote significant, think about the number of points that a person gained and compare that to the number of points someone of similar age in the norm group or norm sample gained. For example, if a person gained 25 GSV points on the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test from grade two to grade three, I would consider that a significant increase because you, as you can see here in this chart, the median growth during that time is around 20 GSV points. To go a step further in the discussion on the previous slide about how to gauge progress on GSV scores, here I have listed four steps to guide how to interpret that progress. Step one is to simply give a test and then compute the scores. As you can see here, I'm listing both the PPVT and EVT as the tests that I'll use for comparison. Step two is to give the same test or tests again at a later date when you need to determine if progress is being made. GSV scores become, become meaningful the second time you give a test because it's at this time you can compare performance. Step three is to compare GSV from time one to time two on the same test or the same measure. And step four is to compare standard score and percentile ranks from time one and time two. Now on the following slides, I'm gonna give concrete examples of these steps. In our first two scenarios, we're looking at a child's performance on the PPVT5 and EVT3 across two administrations. Now remember the steps we reviewed on the previous slide. Step one is to give the tests. Step two is to give the same tests again in order to determine progress on a skill. An example would be if a child was receiving targeted intervention or vocabulary enrichment and you wanted to determine if that child was making meaningful or sufficient progress. If we look at the GSV scores, we see that this child showed improvement in receptive vocabulary from time one to time two. The same is true for expressive vocabulary. Now looking at the standard scores, we see that this child was able to make progress even faster than peers, which is why the standard score increased. For expressive vocabulary, even though the child made progress, they did so at the same rate as the peer group, which continues to leave them far below average for their age. Although this child is below average compared to peers in both areas, as the peers was, were developing expressive and receptive vocabulary skills during the time between the two tests, the child was also making similar gains in development. In this example, let's look at a GSV score for a math test, math computation. You can see that the GSV increased for this child by 33 GSV points, which is a pretty big skill increase. However, you can see that there was a slight decrease in standard score which would indicate that his student's skill improved at a slightly slower rate than his peers. With this type of a finding, I would say that although we have some improvement in skill, if this child doesn't continue to make progress and start to increase the speed of progress, they're at risk of falling farther and farther behind their peer group. In our last scenarios, let's also look at a profile that tells a very different picture regarding progress. This child made no improvements in listening comprehension and actually lost some skills in reading comprehension across time, as you can see by the lower GSV at time two. Also, both standard scores show that while this child was either not making or losing skills, the peer group continued to develop both. So I would become concerned that this child is not only falling farther behind peers, but also they stop making progress and are likely regressing in comprehension of written text. While these scenarios are likely more rare than the previous three I showed you, they can occur, oftentimes as the result of a traumatic brain injury or serious medical condition, among other things. In the reading comprehension scenario, imagine a student with poor phonological decoding skills. This type of scenario is also possible when, for example, that student has not made progress in basic reading, which then affects their ability to comprehend text of increasing difficulty. Many clinical and academic reasons exist for skill de decreases, but it's clear that the prognosis in this case should concern the evaluator. In the final section of this presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a best practice warning. 
which is to be cautious about using age or grade equivalents when measuring progress. First, let's answer the question, what are age and grade equivalents? Well, they're simply the median score of all the students at a particular point in time in the norm sample. So for example, in the norm sample, all the students in the third month of the grade five, we took the absolute middle of the student score as the 5-3 grade equivalent. The grade equivalent or age equivalent is not an actual representation of that child's age or grade. So for example, I have two there, grade and age. You see 5-3 is the grade five, third month, or age 12-10 is the 12 years, 10 month old. Those are the median scores for those particular points in time. So as to whether or not grade and age equivalents are effective or should be used in your particular case, I want you to think about how they're used and what they actually tell us. So here are two scenarios to do just that. In the first one, Susan was given the Y at three in November, and again a year later. The first test yielded a grade equivalent of four, five. The second yielded a grade equivalent of five, one. So think about what does that tell you? In the second scenario, Jason was given the Y at three in September, and again a year later. His first grade equivalent was two, three, and the second was three, two. And what does that tell us? Can we compare Susan's progress to Jason's? So what I'd like to think about in that scenario is that even though we see there are increases in the grade equivalent from time one to time two for both students, are they comparable? Does that evaluation or yardstick that we're using to measure progress, is that comparable across students? A general best practice is for us not to use age or grade equivalents to measure progress. First, as mentioned earlier, they are descriptive metrics for a particular point in time and not linked to curriculum or development. Equivalents should not be compared across tests. Why? Because they're not on an equal interval scale as GSV or standard scores are. And also because we measure slightly different constructs across tests. Age and grade equivalents are also not as stable given the wide variations in age development and learning that occurs at different grades. We tend to learn different amounts of information at the start of a grade than at the end of a grade, as well as different amounts of information in earlier grades than in later grades. These variabilities can make measuring progress very difficult and leave you prone to errors. There are many clinical measures across development, achievement, and speech and language that report GSV scores. In order to find more information on which tests do report GSV scores, please visit pearsonclinical.com. Thank you for listening in to this short informational webinar on growth scale values and measuring progress. Have a great day.